welcome back to another episode of the Cannabis Real Podcast. It is your girl Rachel back with another episode. We are in James chapter 2, part 1, verses 1 through 13. But before we get ready to jump in, I just want to say thank you so, so much for everybody who has watched the video, who has liked the video, and who has been sharing the videos. Thank you so much for helping me grow the audience, helping me grow the channel. I hope this message is encouraging to you and um, they have been encouraging and that they will continue to be encouraging to you. And so just continue to please like the videos and share the videos with people. If someone shared it with you, share it with somebody else so we can grow the audience. Um, but like I said, we're going to do James chapter 2 verses 1 through 13. Hopefully this won't take too, too long. But as I was studying, I was, I was, this it's a little heavier than I, <laughs> it's a little heavier than I initially thought when I was just, and I briefly skimmed it earlier this week. So we are going to pray and then we're going to jump into the recap and then we're going to jump into chapter two. So to Heavenly Father, God, I pray, Lord, that this message will be um, useful and, and helpful and convicting, Father God, to our hearts, Lord, that it will it will help us to see ourselves and then help us to see ourselves the way you see us, Father God. I pray that it will lead to repentance and will lead to a convicted heart. And I pray, God, that you will give me the words to say that will I'm able to articulate what it is that you have for those listening to this message to hear today. I pray all these things and many, many more in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, like I said, we're going to do a brief recap. So, chapter one, and I'm really just going to do chapter one, part two, the recap of the last video. But we talked about being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. And with that, we went to Ephesians chapter four, where Paul kind of talked about putting off our old selves um, that have been corrupted by deceitful desires and instead putting on our new selves and being made new in the attitude of our minds. So we kind of fleshed that out a little bit. Then we moved on to actually doing what the word says and not just listening to it and being and fooling ourselves. That was where the mirror, mirror on the wall aspect came into play for chapter two, uh, chapter one, part two. Don't like uh, letting the word be a mirror and then not just looking in that mirror, reading the word and then turning around and forgetting what the word says and never actually putting into practice what the word says. James is like, don't do that. <laughs> um, and he obviously felt the need to say, don't do that because people were doing that. We do that. So he had to remind us, don't do that. And we also, we talked from there, we went to, um, Exodus 31 really quickly, just to talk about how the children of, to, to juxtapose, I guess, the idea of looking in the mirror and then turning around and forgetting what you just saw, what you looked like to how in Exodus 32, the children of Israel, they had just come out of, um, Egypt, God, part of the Red Sea, you know, they've seen signs and miracles with the Red Sea, with the 10 plagues, with, um, uh, being provided with manna and, and water in the desert, in the wilderness. They'd seen all these things. And now Ma uh, Moses was on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. He was only gone for 40 days. And yet they were like, he's been gone. Moses has been gone a little too long. Aaron, build us that golden calf so we can worship it. And Aaron was like, okay. And it was just so quick that they turned around from all that they had seen, all that they had experienced with God. And they turned quickly to back to idolatry. So I juxtapose that to how we look in the mirror, we look into the word, we read what it says, yet we turn around and decide not to do it. That's wrong. We don't need to do that. That's not the attitude we need to have. Uh, we also talked about how James tells us how to look in the mirror and to not forget. He tells us to look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, to continue in that perfect law, which is the new covenant, and then to not forget what you heard. You don't forget what you heard by actually putting it into practice. So immediately put it into practice. If God tells you to forgive, think of, I'm, I'm sure there's people who pop into your mind where you know you need to forgive them. That's when you start putting it into practice. Start asking God to help you to forgive. Show you how to forgive in this situation. Help you to let go of any resentments, any angers you may be holding against people. And then lastly, James talked about religion versus religious people. And he was talking to, and he said, basically, you know, if you can't tame your tongue, your religion is worthless and you're lying to yourself. And as I said in the last video, James chapter three talks like really heavily about taming your tongue. So we're going to save that discussion for James chapter three. But going back to the religion being worthless aspect of it, he says, what is good religion? What is true religion? Um, what God considers pure and faultless is to take care of the widows and the orphans and to keep yourself from being polluted from the world. 
So that was a brief recap of James chapter one verses. Um, it was like, let me see anything. It was verses 19 through 27. So we are jumping into James chapter two today and it is verses one through 13. So I'm going to read them as we've been doing the past couple of videos. I'm going to read them and then we're going to go back and kind of break it up into sections and discuss. So James chapter two, verse one starts off saying, my brothers and sisters, believer in our believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are exploring. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the, the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you must not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Ooh. So like I said, heavy, <laughs> it's heavy. It's full of some stuff. So this is going to take us some time. So just bear with me. So we're going to start off going back to verses one through nine. And I'm going to kind of, we're going to, we're going to take it chunk by chunk. So it talks about we as believers, and Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. And I want to start off by saying that God does not show favoritism. And that's not a new idea in the New Testament. That's not new under the new covenant with Jesus. That's Old Testament. That's law. That's Old Testament Bible. That's uh, Exodus, Leviticus. It actually says like, don't show favoritism in these past, in these, in these uh, books. And you have to also remember once again, like we said in the first video, James is writing to Jewish Christians, Jewish believers. So they would have been very familiar with the royal law that he says, with the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. They would have been very familiar with these principles. They know that God does not show favoritism. So, and he does not show partiality. And especially when it comes to like lawsuits, which talks about lawsuits are kind of what the, the don't show favoritism is in Ecclesiastes and I'm not Ecclesiastes. I don't know where that came from <laughs> in Exodus. Goodness. So the idea of not showing favoritism, especially like in a lawsuit law, like a court type, um, situation, you can think about even in today's society, how we see, um, we see poor people or people who are a little less fortunate being innocent people, they could be innocent or they may be guilty, but they were not judged fairly. So you have innocent people being convicted of crimes that they did not commit, but because they have poor um, lawyers, they have bad lawyers, they don't have good lawyers because they can't afford good lawyers. Or you have people who are poor, like financially, and they can't afford to have good lawyers and they may have committed the crime. But if it's, if the law, you know, if the law of the land says you get five years for theft and yet this person was convicted and sentenced to 10 years only because purely because their lawyer was not good because they couldn't afford a good lawyer because the person they stole from wanted to press extra charges they were going up against a corporation going up against um you know a wealthy individual they were judged unfairly so that's the whole point it's like you're judged unfairly and that's favoritism that's not good that's no bueno right 
And so that's just kind of like a, a slight way we can see that today in our court systems. I know you have plenty of examples for yourself where you can look around and see how that was a mishandling of justice. This person was judged unfairly. Um, the court showed favoritism to the rich. The court showed favoritism to the influential. The court showed favoritism to the wealthy, to the big corporation, because they just had an army of lawyers at their disposal versus someone who only had one court-appointed court attorney kind of energy. So just a, just a little example to kind of relate back to Exodus and Leviticus when he's talking about showing favoritism. But once again, remember that the law... The old, Jesus makes the old law perfect and complete. So it all works together, right? So, but James, like I said, just to give an example about the court system from Exodus, James uses a specific example of a rich man and a poor man coming into the meeting place, coming to the assembly, and he challenges our hearts on how we should treat each one, right? He's challenging you, like you see a poor man and a rich man coming into the assembly, and he's and he's gonna tell you how you how you would treat not how you should but how we do treat the rich man versus the poor man and he's calling us out right it's very convicting and so I'm gonna read I'm gonna read I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to Galatians chapter two and then we're gonna come back to James chapter two and read verses three and four over again so in Galatians let me see if I get it let me get it. Galatians chapter 2, I'm going to start in verse 1 just to give a little bit of context. So, Galatians 2 verse 1, it says, this is Paul writing to the letter of Galatia. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation um, and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. The gospel, I was, ooh, yeah, I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Making, he was double checking to make sure that what he was telling the Gentiles wasn't, you know, was sound doctrine, a sound gospel. He says in verse three, yet not even Titus who was with me was compelled, um, not even Titus who was with me was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves, slaves to the old law, slaves to having to be circumcised to be considered, you know, saved essentially. In verse five, it says, we do not give in to them for, we don't give in to them for a moment. So the truth of the gospel might be persevered. I'm sorry, preserved for us. Verse six is the high point. It says, as for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they make, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. So the key point was that was that like God doesn't show favoritism. I wanted to give a little context because I hate to take things just purely out of context. But he's talking about um, Paul speaking about like some of the esteemed Jewish leaders who, according to the old law, despite being under the new law, said that Gentile believers had to be circumcised. So just briefly, to get more in information on that topic, which is not what we're talking about today, but the whole idea of circumcision and Greek versus Jew, all this good stuff, go to Romans 2 and 3 and just read Romans chapter 2 and 3, and it'll give a lot more context, a lot more information on that. So now, like I said, so the whole point was, those who are held in high esteem, whatever they, Paul's like, whoever they are, I don't really care. God doesn't show favoritism. And I wanted to point out the high esteem part, right? Because we tend to hold people who we, we, we deem as influential leaders in the church, leaders in the community, wealthy people, people you see on TV, X, Y, and Z. We hold them in high esteem. And Paul's like, it don't matter who you are, God doesn't show favoritism. So jump back to James chapter two, and we're going to start in verse three. Remember, he's giving you this, this example of a poor man and a rich man both coming to the assembly. He says, if you were shown, if you show special attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit at the, sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves? and become judges with evil thoughts. 
he said, have you not discriminated? Like, ugh, that's how, like, discriminated? Like, you know, when we think discrimination, we think of one, there's a couple different things that may come to mind with me as an African-American woman. I think of, you know, the obvious discrimination. Where well, I'm not, I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to touch it because that's not what we're talking about. But discrimination, discriminated is a heavy word. It has a very negative connotation. And then he goes even further to say judges with evil thoughts. Once again, he's like, have you, by you saying to the rich man, come sit by me. I got you a good seat. It's in the front row. But you tell him the poor man, go stand in the back. You know, you'll, you'll, you can, or go sit on the floor. Since you're just, you just need, you need, you need to get a word. Go sit on the floor. But this rich man, we're going to treat you right. We're going to, do you need, you need some water? Do you want something to drink? Are you comfortable? Is this a good seat for you? Can you see? Can you hear? But the poor man gets to go stand in the back and don't, don't cause any trouble. The blatant disregard, right? The blatant discrimination between how you treat one person versus how you treat another. And I don't think James is talking about like how, I don't think he's, I, what, okay. Let me, let me step, let me step back. I don't think James is talking about treating everyone like they're your best friend because I kind of struggled with that, right? I'm thinking about like when I'm asking myself this question, do I show favoritism to people, especially in my church congregation, like other people that I show favoritism to, do I treat them differently? And the answer is yes. And I was like, oh snap, am I discriminating? And I had to think about that for a little bit. And then I was thinking, I was like, I don't think James means like you need to treat everybody you come across like they're your best friend, right? Jesus had 12 disciples that he kept close. There were many people who followed him, many people who were called disciples, but he had 12 that he really leaned into, really poured into who he communed with, right? Outside of, I guess you, outside of the normal day to day, right? So I'm like, I don't think James is talking about treating everybody like you're, they're your best friend. I don't think that's what he means by showing favoritism or partiality. What I do think he means is treating everyone with love, respect, and humanity. Treating everybody with the love they deserve because they are a child of God. They are a created being of God. He's poured his, his breath into them. Treating them with respect, with love, and just basic human dignity. So from there... We're going to read verse, we're going to read, we're going to jump to verses five through nine, and then we're going to jump to Luke, and we're going to read a parable from Luke. So picking back up in verse five, talking about have you, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and have, and become judges with evil thoughts? He says, listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Remember the Sermon on the Mount? Remember the blessings versus the woes? Blessed are, blessed are those who are poor, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. He says in verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor. That's right. Like he said, you're discriminating against them. You've dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are not they the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming in the noble name of whom you belong? Jesus. Verse eight, it says, if you really, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. He's like, if you really, if you truly keep the love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing good. He says, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. So keep that in mind. Now we're going to jump to Luke chapter 16. Oh goodness, where am I? Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 20, 19 technically through 25. So Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19 says, this is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. This is Jesus speaking. He said, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. So let's think about that, right? It's a take this idea of that uh, that James presents in chapter two of a rich man entering your assembly and a poor man rich, entering your assembly. The rich man is wearing purple and fine linens and lives in luxury, and the poor man is a beggar 
covered in sores, just begging for crumbs from this rich man's table, scraps, things that you would give your dogs. He was like, just give me something, right? And he said he sat at, he, at, his man, at this man's gate. He was, was, Lazarus was laid up and the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, think about that. That's kind of nasty, right? It's kind of a nasty kind of like picture. You got somebody covered in sores and you, if you have a dog, dogs will get all up in your business and have no, no personal boundaries. So the idea of a dog licking your wounds is, is nasty to me. <laughs> it's not an appetizing thought. It's really, dis it's quite disturbing, you know, to think about. And he, they're really showing you the, 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 they're showing you how broken this man was, how he was, he was in terrible shape, right? Really bad shape. Lazarus is in his little house, chilling with his beautiful robes, eating healthy, eating, maybe not eating healthy, but eating, getting full every day, living in luxury. And this man outside his gate is struggling detrimentally. Like he is in terrible condition. And then, so I just want to take that thought and just kind of pause there, right? Dogs are licking his wounds. He is in terrible shape. Lazarus needs help. So we're going to jump into 22. And I want you to notice how the parable does not say that the rich man did anything to help Lazarus, right? Lazarus died. <laughs> the rich man died. They both died. Because death comes to us all, right? Because God shows no favoritism. So we're going to pick back up in verse 22. But I really, but before, like I said, while I'm reading the rest of verse 22 through 25, really think about the rich man. Like picture that in your mind. Picture a, a, a person coming into your uh, your worship assembly, coming into your life, coming into your, your community who is wealthy, well off, well articulated, well, you know, well educated versus someone coming into your home, your community, your assembly who is poor, clothes is kind of raggedy, you know, probably might need a bath, needs to be cleaned up, needs some help, needs a lot of help, not just some help. And how just, like think about how you would treat those people, right? So starting back in Luke chapter 19, verse 22, it said, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. It says in Hades, where he was tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. So I just wanted, I wanted to paint that picture because... Remember how James chapter 1 verse 27, remember how James 1 ended. Religion that God accepts as pure and faultless is to look after the orphans and the widows. And it, he says orphans and widows, but in my opinion, I believe he's talking about people, right? Care for people. Look after those who are less fortunate of your, than yourselves and keep yourself from being polluted by the world. So we think about what God considers as pure and faultless religion of caring for people and loving people. And then James jumps right into don't show favoritism because that is, that is in direct opposition to treating people and loving people the way they should and deserve to be treated according to how God has loved and had mercy on us and forgiven us and cared for us. Right? So yeah, that kind of, that's kind of that thought, that idea of, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law's lawbreakers. And I brought, like I said, I brought in the rich man and Lazarus, that parable that Jesus tells them to kind of help kind of further paint that picture of the different, how we, how we discriminate against the rich man versus the poor man. The rich man, he's already way over here. He thinks he's way over here and the poor man's literally at his gate begging him for food. 
And the rich man is like, nah, I don't need, rich man probably didn't even see him. Or if he saw him, he just walked right by and probably forgot all about him. He probably didn't see Lazarus again until the day he died. He looked up and he saw Lazarus by Abraham's side. And he's like, wait a second. <laughs> he's like, hold up. You know, this is, he's like, wait a second. It doesn't tell you all that the rich man did, you know, but it wasn't purely because he was rich that he went to Hades, you know, and Lazarus was by the, in Abraham's bosom, as some translations say. That wasn't why. It was because of all he things he did, probably with his money, with his wealth, his wealth and his riches, um, his attitude and his heart mindset, his unbelief, you know, all those good things. That's what led him to go to Hades. But just remember, like, Everything works together. So the thought that ends in James chapter 1 is the same idea that's picking up in James chapter 2. Loving the widows and the orphans, keeping yourself polluted from the world. Don't show favoritism. You see a wealthy man, you see a poor man, treat them the same, right? Treat them both with humanity, with love and respect. And he's uh, and he's saying don't discriminate. So I'm like just I'm just challenging all of us to Yes, especially when we're in our worship assemblies, when we're in church, when we're communing with communing with a body of believers. But even just your mindset when you're driving down the road, right? You see somebody kind of, you know, kind of dressed in. You see, so you see a doctor walking down. You may see a doctor downtown or wherever your hospital is as you're driving, and then you see somebody who looks like they're homeless. Don't just in your mind. You you probably have already discriminated, right? You're already like, mm, X, Y, and Z about this person, but this doctor is probably this, this, and that. Third, just don't discriminate, you know, don't discriminate. I'm sorry if I'm rambling and my thoughts don't make sense. This was a very, it was, this is a very rich passage and I still feel like it needs to be dug into more. And at this time, I just don't feel, I don't feel like I'm, I'm giving you all that I have gotten, right? And as I continue to study, I'm sure I'll get more, but this is what I have for you today. <laughs> so hopefully it will be uh, nourishing to you. So that kind of wraps up the idea for now for James chapter two, verses one through nine. So then we're going to jump to 10 and 11, have a thought and then 12 and 13 and I have a thought and then I'll be done. So verses 10 and 11, which picks up right after. So we're going to read nine as well. It says, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who has said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you should not murder. But if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Now, let's make this a little more practical, right? In our everyday lives. We say, I don't lie. I don't steal, but are you always truthful? You know what I'm saying? Like when you, when it's time, if, if you did something wrong, do you own up to it? If you're at work and your people, you know, someone's like, someone as simple as, did you, did you, did you use the last paper towel and you didn't put a paper towel roll back? I'm like, no, I didn't use the last paper towel. No, I'm good and well. You got a paper towel in your hand right now. You know, or something a little more, um, a little more deep and potentially a little more convicting. You know, it talks about adultery and murder. It says, I didn't, I didn't kill nobody. But did you lie? Have you lied? Did you, did you lie yesterday? I'm like, no, I didn't, I didn't commit adultery. Jesus said, did you look upon a woman with lust? Did you look upon another woman lustfully? You committed adultery in your heart, right? So I'm like, yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't go out and have, you know, an affair with somebody, but you, you committed adultery in your heart by looking lustfully upon another woman. You know, he's like, you didn't lie, but you stole. He's like, you stole, right? I saw you three, you stole them, you stole the, them $3 off the, you know, Knowing good and well, it was the part you just saw who dropped the money. You're walking and you saw somebody drop some money. And instead of picking that money up and giving it to the person, you just picked it up and went the other way. You stole. You know who it belonged to and you decided to take it for yourself. So he's he's really being like, you say you, like you can, 
You can say, I did not lie. I did not commit adultery. I have not murdered anybody. But did you dishonor your mother and your father? <laughs> like, James is like, if you if you missed the ball on one, you met, you then you broke the whole law. Once again, your religion is worthless because you can't even tame your tongue. Right? So he's really like, if you say you don't commit adultery, if the one, if God says don't commit adultery and God also say don't murder, and you're like, I didn't commit adultery, but you murdered, then it, the fact that you didn't commit adultery literally means nothing <laughs> because it's all sin, right? It's all sin. And that's the kind of picture he's painting with favoritism. Showing someone, fa showing favoritism seems kind of small, it seems minuscule, right? It seems like, well, they're all getting the word. You know, if they're in the church, the person, you can hear in the back, just like you can hear in the front row, but you're missing it. You're missing the point. The point is God tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves. You can't love your neighbor as yourself if you're discriminating amongst your neighbors, right? You can't love your neighbor as yourself if you're, if you're picking and choosing well, they got money. They look they look well dressed. We're going to let them sit down in the front row. They look well dressed. I'm going to invite them into my house. I'm going to choose them to be hospitable to. When there's somebody who actually is in need of food, those are the ones you should be hospitable to. And matter of fact, I think the the point that James is making is that everybody should be invited. You know, not just the person who you feel like can bring something to the table, but the one who feels who, you know, is not going to bring any food to the potluck. You need to invite them just as just the same as you would invite somebody who would. So once so like I'm hoping this point is getting across. I'm really hoping it's being driven home. James is not mincing words. He said what he said. He's like, you You guys know so well the law, right? You know you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. But you sin every time you show favoritism You could because you are dishonoring the poor. Man. And reminder, once, he, once again, back in verse 5, he says, don't you remember that God has chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? And those are the ones who inherit the kingdom of God. So he's like, get your priorities straight. Remember, we don't live in the world. We we may live in the world, but we are not of the world. We are of the spirit. And we need to see people different. We need to see people the way God sees people. God sees everybody as an opportunity to show love, respect, humanity, to bear fruits for and to give fruits to. The fruits being the fruits of the spirit, showing goodness, mercy, patience towards. Not just those who we deem as deserving of it, right? So, once again. I hope I'm really driving this point home. I'm really hoping this, what James is saying is he's challenging the way you think about people and the way we think about ourselves and how we see ourselves. He's like, don't think you the rich man, right? Don't come into the assembly thinking you deserve to be treated some kind of way. So anyway, I digress. I digress. We're already over and I have one more little, I have two more things I want to point out. So with this idea of whoever keeps the law but stumbles over one point as a lawbreaker. You say you love you say you you don't commit adultery, but you look at a woman lustfully. You've committed adultery in your heart. You know, you canceled it out. You say you don't commit murder, but you you just stole from somebody else. It's it, you're lying to yourselves, right? Let's go to Romans chapter 3 verses 20 through 24. So this says Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscience, conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through Jesus, I'm sorry, given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So once again, that further, that's another point to kind of talk about that I'm not going, I'm, I'm going to mention it, but I'm not going to flush it out. The whole idea of favoritism between the Jews and the Gentiles. God does not show favoritism even between Jews and Gentiles. He doesn't show favoritism between the poor and the rich. 
It doesn't show favoritism between Jew and Gentile. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You can be you can be as rich as the day is long, but if you're a sinner, you're you're still your 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 wealth, your good deeds are still but filthy rags to the Lord, because all have sinned and fallen short. But just as all have sinned and fallen short, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that comes by Christ Jesus. So that's a great message. That's a great thing because we just got done talking about how you you say you don't commit adultery, but you commit murder, right? All have sinned and fallen short, but praise God for his grace to the redemption that comes from Christ Jesus, which flows right into the last two verses of this chat of this section that we're going to talk about today. Verse 12, it says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. This law that gives freedom is what we just read about in Romans 3, 20 through 24. That this righteousness is, is given through faith in Christ Jesus, right? So it says, so don't, uh, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Judgment without mercy so if you judge somebody, if you judge somebody and you don't show them mercy, it will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful because mercy triumphs over judgment. And the scripture that I wanted to go to is in Luke. And as I was reading it just now, it made me think about the parable of, this is not what I'm going to read, but I'm going to briefly talk about it. The parable of um, the two servants, right? The parable of the servant who owed his master in today's wealth, millions of dollars. And he was like, have mercy on me. And the, the master was like, or the king was like, all right, I have mercy on you. Your debt's canceled. And then that same servant, ooh, that's the one I should have did. Oh my goodness. Now I need to find it. I found it. So I was talking about, um, in, ver in James chapter 2, verse 13, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Anyone who's not been merciful, mercy triumphs over judgment. So originally I was going to just stop at Luke chapter 6, but I'm going to read Luke chapter 6. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 18, um, verse 23. No, 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 I'm not going to start at 23. Um, I'm just I'm going to talk about the parable of um, the unmerciful servant right? The parable of the unmerciful servant that goes perfectly with the idea of judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. So if you haven't read it, please go back and read it. Cause I'm just going to paraphrase because we're already over time, but it is in Matthew chapter 18 verses 23 through 35, 23 through 35. So in the parable, Jesus is Pointing about this, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a man. It's like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So the servant, this first servant, owes his master, the king, a whole bunch of money. And the, the servant comes to the master and is like, please have mercy on me. I'll pay you. You know, don't, don't send me to jail. Don't sell my family. And the king is like, all right, I'll have mercy on you. Your debt is forgiven. He cancels the debt. It says, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. It says, but when that same servant whose debt was literally just canceled and pause real quick, that folds right back into James chapter one, right? Of reading the word, looking into the mirror and then turning around and forgetting what you just read, turning around and forgetting what you look like. This man was literally just forgiven in what today, in today's coins, millions of dollars. He goes and finds a servant. So he goes and finds a servant who owes him a few hundred coins. Actually, it's just a hundred silver coins versus him, him, the servant, the unmerciful servant who owes his, who owes the king 10,000 bags of gold, right? You owe somebody 10,000 bags of gold. You owe the king 10,000 bags of gold. The king had mercy on you, pitied you, canceled the debt and let you go. You turn around forgetting what you look like forgetting what you just read and you go and find somebody who owes you a hundred civil coins and you go and throw them into jail threatening to sell their family and be like you need to pay me what you owe me 
So let's read about how the rest of the story ends. If you don't already know, it's a really common parable, but it says, so in verse 31, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. He says, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? It says in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how our, this is how my heavenly father, this is Jesus talking. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart. All right. Once again, James says, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So now we're going to read Luke chapter 6, verse 35 through 34. That says, But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given unto you. I'm going to stop right there. So like I said, we're already over time. But there's a lot of ideas that are really flowing in this. And like, it's funny because like I said, the the Matthew 18 parable of the merciful, the merciful servant, I had, I was, it didn't click until I was reading it just now. That that's the parable that I that I really needed to reference when it comes to this last to verses twelve and thirteen. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. So I want to take some take some time for yourself after listening to this episode. Pray about it. Read James chapter two. You can read all of James chapter two, but really focus on one through thirteen because that's what's kind of been fleshed out. That's what's been talked about, and really meditate on. What are the things that I, that, am I showing favoritism to people within the community of believers, within the assembly? Am I showing favoritism to people in the world? You know, are we, am I judging people unfairly? Am I judging people without mercy? Am I, am I, am I saying that I don't do this? I don't do this sin, but then I do that one, right? Like take some time to really like ask God to show your, show yourself, Help, ask God to help you see yourself, the good and the bad, and then bet, and then ask, and then repent from the bad and ask God to make you over. He's already made you over, but that, that asking to make you over is that humility that we need, right? That, hum, that humble spirit that we need that comes to God with request of making us better, making us new, making us as we, as he sees us right? Making us as we are supposed to be because we have been made new in Christ Jesus. So anyway, that was a lot. That was kind of heavy. It was kind of long and I apologize, but I digress. Um, I'm going to pray and then we're going to be done. So Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, God, for this word. I pray, God, that it will be convicting to those who hear it, Father God, that you will open ears and eyes to receive and to see what it is that you have for them in this passage, God. I pray, Lord, that despite my ramblings, that you, Holy Spirit, will speak directly to the individual and that you will convict their heart of the thing that you need them to be convicted of from this message. I pray all these things and many more in the mighty name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, that's all I have. Remember to like the video, comment on the video if you enjoyed it. Comment your remarks about the video, about the episode. If it was too long, let me know and I'll apologize, you know. Um, but share the video with somebody if you haven't already. And subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. But anyway, until next time, bye!